Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Friday Coffee Meetup. I'm Christy Connor, your host. We are so happy that you're here with us today. We have a really cool topic to talk about. And we are a normally an in-person meetup. We traditionally meet at Cross Campus, but due to the COVID-19 crisis, we have transitioned to virtual. We are based in Los Angeles, California, and have about 7,000 members whom we are grateful for, and we can't wait to see their smiling, healthy, happy faces when we get back to our in-person programming. In the meantime, for those of you who are at home and you want to learn something new, we do have information in the chat window on our, our videos. We have a YouTube channel as well as a podcast channel, so you can check that out there. Although you're seeing my face right now, there is actually a whole host of people behind this meetup that make it happen every week, and you're seeing their faces now. We are a volunteer-driven organization, so they spend their time each week to make this happen and be a benefit for our community, and we are really grateful for them. We are also grateful for Echo Factory, who sponsors us. So today we are going to try some new things. So prepare yourselves to try out something new today. In the chat window, you will see all the information. As usual, if you've come to one of our previous meetups, we are gonna do the Q&A via the Q&A panel. So put your questions into the Q&A panel. Don't put them in the chat panel. So that's one thing. Something else, that is going to be new for today is that we are actually going to do some polls during Kurt's presentation. So be prepared. You will get a poll. You will be able to answer the questions, and then we will share the polling results with you. We know that for our members, it's been a little bit difficult to not be able to interact in person. Um, we've allowed kind of open chat so that you guys can chat with one another. But something that we're going to try today, if you guys are interested, um, is that we're going to try and move the people who want to stay and network a little bit, maybe answer some questions, interact um, at the end of the presentation and Q&A over into the panelist panel so that you can have your video and you can speak to other members. That's going to be a little bit curated. We're going to ask a question or two. Um, so feel free to join us at the end. Just kind of stay stay on, and we'll move you from attendees to panelists. Let's see. If you have jobs that you're hiring for, we are all about finding people new jobs, new passions, new careers. So please feel free and list those in the chat window if you are hiring. I'm very excited to have Kurt Wedge with us this morning already just coming on. We're trying a lot of new things because of him, so we are grateful to have him join us. He is going to talk to us today about sustainability and how blockchain can help companies kind of ensure transparency, that they're doing the right thing, as well as benefit the consumer. He is an adjunct professor at uh, Seattle University, as well as leading IBM's North America practice for retail consumer products and the travel industries. And he's also about innovation and entrepreneurship. He was the former chair of Seattle University's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Board. And he's going to talk to us about technology, how it can provide transparency, it can help consumers understand around fair labor, how it can impact the use of natural resources things like eco-friendly eco packaging, positive carbon footprints. So Kurt, we are so pleased to have you with us this morning. I'm gonna stop sharing and I will turn it over to you. Christy, thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks for the rest of the folks behind the scenes. We had an early Friday coffee meetup uh, as, a, as a group, and that was a lot of fun. It really is his testament to a group that's been established since I think 2013, the camaraderie built, the stories that have been built, and to where it's going. So sustainability isn't just about products, but it's also about organizations. And I know you have a, just a very solid bedrock. So thank you for the opportunity to talk today. 
what I'd like to do is, is really open up the introduction. You absolutely can under, understand a little bit of my background and my passion. But I'd like all of us to kind of come together. And this is me before aspiring to uh, look at the opportunities I had in life. But if everybody can go back into about this age, and if you can go and remember when you were shopping, you were probably at the head of the cart, probably wasn't a seatbelt at the time. And your parents were, your mom, for me, it was, it was traditionally my mom, would take us down the aisles. And as she would take us down the aisles, that was brand imprinting that was happening. In fact, we would go down the peanut butter aisle. And if you can, go back to that moment and think about the peanut butter that mom or dad put into the cart. They picked it. My question here, and this is going to be our first poll, we're in a poll already out of the gate, is, and Christy's going to post this for you to respond to, do you still use the same brand of peanut butter? So we're going to take a second while the results are coming through. And, you know, it could have been on Wonder Bread, it could have been with carrots, it could have been served many different ways, but do you still use the same brand of peanut butter that you did that was first place in your basket? Let's go ahead and see the results if we can, Christy. Yes, so about half still do, a little over half. What's amazing to me there is if I did the same poll in 2000, we would be at about 75% still using the same brand. That could cause you to reflect and think about what did change. Now, I think there's a number of, of, of drivers that have uh, influenced the change. Right? Nearly half have changed. And one of those is the visibility to information. Right? We're learning more. We're learning about trans fats. We're learning about um, dextrose and sugars. We are learning about how the peanuts are harvested, where they're coming from, how they're made, how they're turned, fair wage, amount of water, energy conservation, uh, carbon footprint. There's a lot that's in there. So a natural reduction is, is, is there a shift from the way that it used to be made to new brands, new opportunities? So I, I, I liken the fact that one, there's a nostalgia that we all just felt going back to that shopping cart. But second is there's also a recognition that we are in moments of brand change. So when we're thinking about sustainability and some of that brand messaging, I wanted to pull up what the UN sustainability development goals are. Here are the 17. You just can type in UN sustainability development goals and, and be able to see these 17. What I've done here is I've bolded uh, actually 13 of the 17 as they can be a part of a brand promise, a brand message. Taking, for example, we want to end hunger or we're providing good health and well-being inside of our product. We're, we're producing the, the water we use for producing genes is in a better situation than we originally put it into our factory. Take a look at the sustainability and the give back and when the terms of energy credits or uh, cleaning up the air inside of our communities. All of these are opportunities for companies to grab a hold of. But the question is, do we trust it? Do we, can we audit it? Do we believe? And if we do, what does, that, what does that mean to me and how am I engaging with those, those brands? Part of what I wanted to share today here in, in, in our time is stories. You know, it, is, it is coffee time. These are stories of, of hope and aspiration. And especially as we're all huddled, hunkered down right now, 
what are we doing? What are the conversations we're having at our tables about companies that are doing the right thing? So today, if we take a look and we think about brands and, and what's driving them, you want to meet the customer demand. You want to be trusted. You, you have a brand promise that you want to aspire to and deliver. And then you want to, are, are we doing it in a fast, right, cheap, or affordable way? Fast, right, cheap, and easy is the, uh, the, uh, the accelerated words I use. Is it fast? Do we get the right product to the right place? Is it fast, cheap, and easy? And to look at this for today's framing, I wanted to go from the consumer digital experience store, supply chain manufacturing back to farm. Kind of that farm to fork. Where can we as individual consumers and the businesses be working together and having and creating great brand experiences? So you'll see a number of logos here. I want to share these stories. And about five in, I'll probably go with uh, another query back to you. So we'll do another poll in a couple. First one that I'd like to, to touch base on is the ability. This is a great start because we are at a copy meetup. And the ability to be able to have, enjoy your coffee, scan a bag, and be able to tip your barista. I mean, not tip your barista, tip your, your farmer. So there's an organization, one of the largest traders in the, in the world for coffee is Sukafina. They have helped spin out a, a company called Farmer Connect, where we are in fact scanning then that bag and ping. Right now we have it in two different uh, countries, one in Latin America, one in Africa, where those farmers who are participating can realize some of the benefits. Why is that important? That's important because today we uh, we are seeing $1 out of a $5 cup uh, being able to go back. So how do we inspire with our brands a better economic balance? Let me shift to an NGO. NGO, Heifer International. Heifer International uh, stands for, for, for many things for the globe, from empowering women to helping in, in poverty and hunger. And they are working on digitizing their value chain. So I've been spending time in Honduras, working with 120 different farms, mapping out their farm, taking a look at their canopy, understanding that the farmer themselves wants transparency about their products. To provide a brand, they want nothing more than knowing that the cup of coffee you pick up comes from them and that you enjoy it. And, and if there's something that, that you want better as a result, they want that communication all the way back to the farm. In fact, it's, it's moved to chocolate and we're moving to ground nuts as well. So this opportunity to make it a, a more interactive value chain with trust and transparency the whole way is what we're really looking for. Let me add a, uh, an even another digital experience. And if you wanted to, you could go ahead and, and scan the QR code here if you have your cell phone nearby. Odds are it's not too far away. But you could scan this QR code. And this is on Mousseline, which is a uh, uh, instant potato product. And when you scan that, you'll understand the farm, how it's grown, how it's harvested you know, get that, that consumer story. Carrefour, which is one of, I, I could say here, it's the equivalent of a Walmart Supercenter, a Target, uh, uh, a large format Target store, has experimented and opened up this, this category. They've also done it with chicken. And we've, we've seen growth in the category. We've also seen now more loyalty to Carrefour. So these opportunities to really share that origin story is in fact providing a, a better brand experience and immersive. So let's go to the next aisle in the grocery store. Let's go to the frozen section. Uh, I'm gonna guess that we've all seen this. We have seen that the door that has been open for a while and like, oh, you, you probably go over and close it, so thank you. But there are also opportunities that we have with sensors. 
and recording this information about when the door is ajar and going over and closing it. In fact, uh, I was a, yes, I was in a Costco a week ago with a mask and they had their alarm because their freezer door had not been closed adequately. So, you know, you were, you were a little taken aback until you asked and found out, oh, okay, yeah, that is our system just letting us know that the door is open. So, you know, we've been in embedding inside of the doors, the, the sensor capabilities, the opportunity just to save energy. If we can save 10% of our energy, right, what can we give back to the rest of the grid? So we're looking at those opportunities from a retail experience. And then shrimp. I don't know what everybody had for dinner last night, uh, but hopefully you have had the opportunity to do a virtual meal with, with family. It's, it's somewhat fun if you, if you haven't, or virtual cooking. Uh, take advantage of, of these times to set up a camera and, and, and just let whatever happens, happens. But when I look at, uh, at, at, at the opportunities for sustainably harvesting our shrimp, safe nets, not capturing the wrong product. This is one where Ecuador, one of the largest producers of shrimp in the world, has come together as a group to show that their harvesting capabilities and techniques do not endanger other animals. And it's, it's one to tell it, and it's one to put it in a CSR report, Corporate Social Responsibility Report, but it's another to then open up the books to the world. And that's, that's what we're asking for here. Let me go with me again now over to Italy. In Italy, uh, and IBM, whom, whom I'm working with, right, have, have been working to share their harvesting story. Now, their uniqueness for, for theirs is the, their blend of ingredients and the uniqueness of their flavor because they have unique climate, because of the soil. And putting your label out there is one way, but adding again, you can see the little QR code to just really become a little bit more immersive. Where do we see this in, in, in adoption? We see a lot of it in adoption in the Asian, in, uh, the Asian Pacific countries. Very, very uh, iPhone forward, very, very scan uh, your product. The adoption here in the US, it's another step, but we're starting to see additional take up because people are interested. So this one is, is a great opportunity then to flip to a poll here and ask, how much more are you willing to pay for a product when you know the origin and sustainability record? So we have a few choices here. We have zero, 10, 20, and 30. What are your thoughts? 0% not willing to pay more. 30%, I guess we could have put higher as well. What are you willing to, to see? Let's see what we, we have for the results, Christy. So over half are willing to pay 20% more there, we almost get to, we get to over a third that are willing to pay 20 or 30%, or two thirds are willing to pay 20 or 30% more. Now there's a bias in this population, I understand, because we are opting in the topic of sustainability. We'd expect that. What's interesting in the data that we have found, and I, I pointed out to Carform, is we're seeing the willingness in the, they're voting with their dollars by spending almost 27% more. So we do see some elasticity that ties very much in line with these statistics. So hopefully, uh, who was it today? I think it was Wayne in, our, in, a, in an earlier call said, hey, I'm right in line with, with where the rest of the group is. Obviously a lot of you are right there in that 20% and there's some validation. What is scary though is we end up selling in the U.S., 175% of the amount of product that is declared as organic. So we are selling more organic than what is officially identified 
and certified as organic. How is that possible? So that's where you, you're skeptical. You need that information. You need validation into those certificates. Let's go to a couple more. This is one of, uh, one of my favorite uh, really feel-good stories for Beyond, beyond a brand, this one is more about how do you change the world? And it shifts a little bit to some blockchain capabilities. Although all the rest of the previous examples tie to blockchain as well. This is one where uh, a group called Plastic Bank, wanting to make a difference in the world, identified in Haiti after one of the, the huge storms there that the infrastructure was broken that they didn't have access to the energy. There's only so much energy you could to, to heat your home. They also experience a large amount of, of pollution and recycling is very difficult. So Plastic Bank said, how could we come together and provide an eco uh, a system that would allow recycling of bottles, of water bottles, of plastic, bring it to the center and then give the community credit that can be applied to heating, to cell phone bills, really establishing a cornerstone of an economy while helping Earth. So you know, hats off to, to Plastic Bank for really securing that capability. And this is one that is continuing to be propagated uh, across countries and companies. So while we're out there on that, on that, that big, let's go into a, a couple here with uh, cobalt. So raw materials or diamonds, right? This one is about raw materials, cobalt. How do we know it's being mined safely? How do we know that lives aren't being taken? What are we doing to capture the essence of this? So Ford, Volkswagen, LG, Hayu, have come together to show each part of the process and provide that certification, provide all the origin stories. What does that do? That shows that when you are buying, you're buying a safe product. You may make the choice as a business to not buy from this group, but there is a risk and an exposure because you're being so truthful and transparent are we going to be realizing a differential uh, brand experience and put away the counterfeit, put away those that are, are not doing the right thing? So is there a little bit of additional cost and overhead? There is, but the big switch for us that we found is you end up being more efficient. The more transparent you are, the more the group works together, the better you're gaining efficiencies. So now, you know, it's, it's Friday morning coffee and maybe last night or tonight might be a little wine, but there's also opportunities to reduce your, your water usage. And Ian J. Gallo has put sensors in to record all of the precipitation at the soil level and record, and they've reduced their water consumption by 25%. Again, that's part of that story. How do we capture it in a meaningful way so that it can be shared? And the final story that I wanted to share is palm oil production. Palm oil is wrought with counterfeit. It often is diluted. Uh, it's often not uh, palm oil. And how do we as a consumer really know that, that this is, is trusted? So we do have scanning technologies that we put in place now to verify at the bottle level. And you're also able to then see the, the origin. So what I wanted to do, right, was just use a lot of anecdotes to show there's transparency uh, that, that, that's coming, that our brand affiliations can be influenced differently. And what is it that you can do? And I think there's four different areas that, that I put it. That is, as you represent a business and you represent a customer, the consumers voting with your dollars, show that, that it does matter. Act from a business, take the actions, give the transparency, 
provide more sustainable product, but listen to your consumer, learn, listen to your other parties in your ecosystem. Let's go over and think about what else. The consumer can demand transparency. Maybe part of that is through voting with your dollar. The business is how do we measure transparency and how to record it openly? Uh, like I said, many of the, of the companies produce a corporate social responsibility report, but it stops at the glossy. Give us that ability to go further. The consumer engaging digitally, you know, and we talked about even, I don't know how many people did use the QR code. The businesses provide the access, make it very easy for us. And then the consumers share the stories that are making a big imprint or impact, large or small. It's that narrative that's gonna carry and the businesses continue to capture these great stories and share them. So that would be a bit of the, of the, the, the call to action. I wanna open this up uh, here to questions, thoughts, feedbacks, and most important, it's an appreciation of you and this Friday morning and, and your willingness to be stewards for, for planet Earth. Christy? Yes, thank you so much, Kurt. That was very inspiring. Um, before we get started with Q&A, so everybody just um, be aware we're gonna do Q&A through the Q&A panel. So go ahead and put your questions there. Um, before we get started though, Jan just had a question comment. Um, Jan, who's the one who brought Kurt to us. So Jan, please go ahead. Sure, yeah, and Kurt, thanks so much. You just brought so much for us to think about today. And, and I know that uh, there are so many initiatives that are having a, a huge impact on us globally uh, that IBM has been working with a variety of, of corporations and companies with. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, I think, you know, obviously I like to get into the tech and you and I both know the tech really well and not everybody really cares about the tech as much, but can I just, maybe you can just speak to a little bit about why if, if, if someone hears that blockchain is involved, mm -hmm. why is it that uh, you would be able to trust it more than if it were just some database or, or if a database or a blockchain wasn't involved at all? If it was just a QR code that they were going to look at and the company was like, oh yeah, you know, this is real olive oil. You know, what, how, how do you know you can trust it just because blockchain is involved? Great question, great question, Jan. And, and I think part of this is a fundamental of maybe the participants here don't know what blockchain is, and that's completely fair. What we traditionally have, have done is we've recorded on the farm what we produced, where we produced, and it goes to a trader. The trader then sell, sells it to a buyer, buyer sells it to a packager, packager sells it to a wholesaler, Wholesaler sells it to a distributor, distributor gets it to retail. And in each of those, they're storing their own information and they get out of sync, right? Whether it be maybe origin, maybe it be whether uh, quantities and amounts, you end up with individual, expensive to manage individual systems. What we'd like to do is kind of turn that on its head and make it a circle where at any point, from a demand side, we can see what's, what's needed from the, the events like Friday Coffee Meetup, or from, you know, so you have demand signals, but we also have the opportunity now at any moment to share what we're doing for sustainability and not keep it at each individual company, but share it all the way out to the consumer. Blockchain is what's called a shared ledger. So as I record, it's, it's, for, it's broadcast to everyone. Let me use an example. It's like when we used to write postcards to one another on a trip. Then maybe in the 2000s, we started to email to individual friends. Now it's Snapchat, it's Twitter, it's one to many, and that is coming from you and it's shared across. So a little bit of, a, of an analogy there. In why blockchain, it's the security. It's the fact that everybody who is participating is known. And you almost have a neighborhood watch on top of each other uh, if, if there is a bad actor inside. 
a little bit of a long answer, but hopefully some anecdotes in there for, for those who may not be familiar with blockchain. I like the concept of neighborhood watch that it allows for everyone to sort of keep, keep everyone accountable. That's part of the whole supply chain process. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, so we do have quite a few questions. The first is if I have an idea for a business or company non cryptocurrency that uses blockchain technology, what would be a good resource to get expert input advice mentorship to see if it's a viable business idea. And it's a great question. So playing that back, do we have questions about whether the business idea would be a good fit for blockchain? Is that how I could summarize it? Mm -hmm. So there are a number of, of resources, right? Obviously, you can head out here. I, I have on the, on the screen um, IBM Blockchain. Inside of that, we have what makes a good blockchain use case. There are, um, uh, there's a guide right now in World Economic Forum. They have a great little blockchain guide as well that just helps you assess. I think the other is, is, is you've already given the signal by being here and asking that question. There are a lot of local blockchain meetups that you can, can go in and find like-minded who are starting, have started, uh, looking for their next opportunity to go create. So I would take advantage of the network of our, of our virtual networks right now, but I'd also go ahead and, and take a look. And if, if you have one, uh, even I was in Pasadena, Jen, when was that? Already five, six months ago? Mm, and yeah. after that, I, I still have relationships that are going and we're helping folks launch blockchain initiatives in Japan uh, as well as New York, just from Pasadena. Great. Okay. Um, as consumers, how do we know uh, what certifying bodies or seals of approvals to trust? Are there nationally recognized certifications for sustainable? Speaking to all the recent news coverage of counterfeit olive oil. So I was taking the, uh, the backdrop off. So accountable olive oil, are there organizations right now that are involved? Um, yeah. So um, let me repeat that. How do we know what certifying bodies or fields of trust or fields of approval to trust? Is there nationally recognized certifications for sustainable? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that's whoever asked that is right there in, the, in that, that period of we can have many, many bodies that can certify, but how do we know the processes that they're using? And how can we trust their processes? So yes, there are many bodies, but if we're not being open and transparent with what we're doing, we're not willing to put it on a shared ledger of blockchain, then it's only as good as your, your word. And I'm not saying that you can't be doing it incredibly well, but if you are, add that, add that layer of transparency and record it in an open ledger for others to, to be able to see. Don't just keep it on your database. Kind of like playing cards or go fish or old maid, right? Don't just keep your cards hidden. Turn them outwards and show them to the rest of the world. Is there, you know, to follow up on that question, is there any like symbol on packaging that we should trust or, you know, little, how, how do we know for sure that that person is telling the truth? Right. So we may have Rainforest Alliance it's for, for, for coffee. We have fair trade for coffee. And so that's, you, you will look for the different uh, marks. But again, you know, God, yeah, it's there. It says it's organic, but somehow we're selling a lot more organic than we actually have in the world. So that is a, it's an absolute right skeptic to be. And that's where um, in that upper right hand question uh, was demand transparency. Okay. Can okay, I so nothing definite yet, um, but keep asking for it. Jan, go ahead. Well, and I was wondering, I, I've seen some products now that say that they're traced and then they also have a QR code where you can, can check to see, you know, some information, some of the apps that you were showing in your slides. Mm -hmm. Is that what's starting to pop up, do you think, or? Uh... Right, so now, so what, what you're starting to see is you're starting to see QR codes. Um, you know, there's a sustainable palm oil or RSPO group that yes, that's there. There's 
a couple additional as well from Growers Association. So there are labels that can go and, and what's tough is even the farmer has to pay extra to get this certification. So they're investing on their side because they believe that it provides the trust that us as consumers want. So they're having to bear that burden. So you can look at that certification and go, oh yes, that's, that's better than nothing. My challenge is, is for the certification bodies to be even more transparent. And as brands start to expose that on, on QR codes. Okay, great. Um, now companies will have to make a choice between ESG and capital preservation. After all, it is impossible to save the world while they're in negotiations with creditors and bankruptcy court. What's your suggestion? And also, can you clarify what ESG means if you know that acronym? Uh, that was me. Or I can, ask, I can ask out to whoever asked that question, but I think it's around like maybe environmental standards and capital preservation you know, your suggestions around how, how to save the world and deal with bankruptcy court. So ESG, environmental, social, and governance. Ah, so, okay, got it. But those would be the, the three, uh, three letter acronym. That means how are we coming to, to together as in, in, in governmental and in, in compliance? How are we being stewards for, for the earth? And how are we addressing the, the social needs? There is a, there's a teeter totter and, and this is one that, that says, you know, how, what is this, this balance that we look at? Um, let me, I am going to share a quick uh, picture and actually I usually have it in mural. Uh, maybe I'm not. All right. So anyway, I have I have the uh, I have the the, the teeter totter there. You're always balancing water consumption, uh, deforestation, uh, energy consumption, versus we also are in this to make money, where it's not just about making money, but it's also how do you do it in in the right way. So. The, uh, the Leadership Business Roundtable, and you can take a look on, on, on that. They have reinvented what the corporation stands for. And it's not, it, they've changed it from just purely profits. And there were 230 major corporations uh, on the signatory of this. So you have one, you have an indication. That was just signed um, last fall, probably August, September. So you can look up the uh, Leadership Business Leadership Roundtable, and take a look there. So there's there's direction that's moving uh, that that we definitely know that we need to be better and more responsible for for our actions. How do you balance that against the economic? Well, part of this is what are they doing with their profits? How are they reinvesting? So am I willing to spend a little bit more for a product? Not that you have to, right? You should be realizing some efficiencies as well. But from your profits, how are you giving back to, to the world? And that's, that's one that, that we want to just continue to push in demand. I am fine giving money to you, Patagonia, because we do know what you're doing for deforestation, right? What are these brands about? How are they, how are they pouring their monies back in? So is it okay? To, to make money? Yes. As long, and we ask that it, it goes also back to the rest of the world. Great. What are the ways to ensure that the digital record on the blockchain always corresponds to the respective physical item? For example, that the item I'm holding has not been replaced and is indeed linked to the blockchain record that I'm reading. So a number of, of examples there. Uh, that's a great question from the, the, the perspective of uh, whether it be a banana, whether it be a collectible, right? You may collect sports cards. Um, you may, right now around your house, you may have a lot of Hot Wheels sitting on the ground. 
And a company like Mattel has started to create digital twins. So that you have the ability to not only take a Hot Wheel and race it around your room, but you can also use the identification of that Hot Wheel to then go online and have virtual online races. How do we uniquely identify that those two products are the same? Not just for the race, but also what if I wanted to trade? What if I want, what if the, this, uh, I have one, it's a little mystery machine, uh, Hot Wheel. What if I wanted to sell that because it's, it's a collectible? So really what we've done with, with blockchain is you establish this unique ID that then lives because on blockchain, that's something that's immutable, doesn't go away. This will have its own life 30, 40, 50 years. And that's where you're starting to see when a lot of the major fashion brands start to adopt is we would like to have this uniquely traced. Are there going to be counterfeits that are trying to? Absolutely. But what is it that we uniquely do, whether it be the scanning of a leather handbag to at the beginning or a diamond? You know, these are high expensive items, right? From a diamond perspective, we're going down to the microscopic level and taking a look at its molecular footprint. And that is now stored on chain. And if that three generations away, you've, you've given it and you've passed it down in, in your generations, you now have that verifiability. So really think about what is what can make this product unique. And you want to make sure that the juice is worth the squeeze. You don't want to overspend, but we're doing with collectible cards even. Great. How can we get this concern for transparency of product origins to matter for people who must stretch their shopping dollar? This is one where that poll is difficult. It says that we're willing to spend more. And if, if we put it to a voting booth and, and once you ultimately close and you have all the, the economic pressures, you are, you are in, a, in, in a hard situation, right? Not everybody's gonna, gonna vote with their dollars for a sustainable environment. They are going to look for the, the, the cheapest, the least expensive, the one that can get them through, through their budget. However, if we are all playing at a, at a higher level in business and are putting back to, to planet Earth, I'd like to see that choice go away, right? Where there is, there are different levels of, of sustainability. There are different levels of organizations investing differently. Um, this, that's, a, that's a really hard one, and that's going to be an individual's decision. Yeah. That's a really tough one. Okay. The idea of tip your farmer sounds very appealing. I believe the same idea could have similar applications to other industries. So the first part of the question is, how do we get more coffee retailers on board with tip your coffee farmer? And then the second question is, who wants to work on a project to get this same program going for farmers providing food to restaurants? Yeah. So I don't know if you have any details about both of those or would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, this, is, this kind of goes back to the, the, and the way I'm tying it back to Jan's first question is now with blockchain, we're providing that transparency and traceability and the ability now to tie the consumer all the way back to the farm. So that's something that, that blockchain uniquely offered. And the, so as um, one of the major brands that is bringing this out of the gate is Folgers. So you're gonna now, I mean, that's a major brand and that ability is going to provide differentiation. Farmer Connect, who we, we called out, uh, that's been established now for about seven months. So it's just now growing, right? So just as, as the entrepreneurs that are here or as individual customers, share that story, right? Ask, hey, wouldn't it be great if? So let's play it forward and think if I go into a restaurant, some of them are opening, right? As I go into a restaurant, why not have the ability to scan something on a menu or on a receipt? You know, did you, did you like this? And if you liked it, did you wanna tip the, 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 the producer? And if it's a local producer, how great is that? 
right? It, it came from a rooftop in LA and you'd like that rooftop and those ingredients to, to receive more benefit. And it's just, there's the, the, the cycle of thinking is new. And if it, if it feels right, just continue to ask for it, right? We're, we're at the ground level that can impact change. Um, do you have any anecdotes of blockchain applied to the provenance of ideas and memes? Provenance of ideas. And memes? And memes. Like little funny graphics that go all over memes, the world. Memes, memes. I'm hearing yeah. M-E-A-N-S. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yes, there are. There's uh, anywhere from Dilbert's. Uh, there are, there are, you know, those, are, those would be some of the cartoons. So yes, um, we just collect them and, and, and recast them. Uh, Jan, I'm even gonna leave and lean, lean to you. You might already have a collection. But is there any way to use blockchain to kind of track, you know, when somebody puts something online, like a cartoon uh, or some funny picture, like to track that through blockchain? Yes. Or okay. like an idea that they have? Yes, and there, there, there are digital watermarks that were, are also being transferred. All right, sorry, I, I interpreted that <laughs> Thank you. Thinking of gaming cards. <laughs> um, so one of the, the, the groups that we're working with, let me extend it to news. So the New York Times, yes, New York Times uh, has you know, fake news issues. So the ability now to go back and say, what's the source? who captured it, when it was captured. The story isn't any longer just about the story, but it's the story of getting the story. So the New York Times has been embodying and, and is now capturing all of that news on there. Uh, cartoons and, and your invisible watermarks, memes, uh, all of those are now have the ability to be digitally recorded and then traced. So yes, um, the one that, we're doing it more with art, uh, you know, large pieces of, of art um, and doing the, 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 the digital scanning. I can't think of where I've launched personally or, or heard in the community that somebody's done it for memes, but could it be done? Yes. Okay. If that's your idea, yeah. oh, okay. And Kurt, Kodak was, was going to do something around photos, right? Right. So that, so that you could have IP for, for the photos as well. Right. And so if you think about that, there may be some uh, ability to address, you know, kind of the, the, the way that pictures are being faked through AI, potentially, if, if the original image can be put on a blockchain. Of course, we don't know if the fake image could be put on a blockchain as well, but hopefully not. Right. <laughs> and, and just assume that... Um. It is good that there will be bad actors. They're going to slide it in. That neighborhood watch that you referred to is it, we're, we will please. Yes, you performed bad once, but you were called out and you were called out in public. Right? So your likelihood of doing it again, you may get a one time gain, but the, the community that's already going to brand, you know, brand you is, is not trusted. All right, go ahead, Kristen. Okay. No, no, um, uh, we're gonna wrap up questions, um, but there was a question from our audience about if you can share your slides. Yeah, what's, how does that- Is that a possibility? That? Yeah, how's that get, so I would say yes. Um, um, we can have maybe Jan, you could send them to Jan and um, she could post them on our meetup page. Jan, does that work for you? Sure, if that works for you, Kurt. Okay. Yeah, I'll take off the, the baby picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, so any last comments, Kurt, from you, things that this brought up that you would like to share with us before we kind of wrap up this piece, introduce next week's, and then go to open networking? Uh, I think first off is uh, everybody made a choice to invest their time today. And you've given yourself a, a signal and a, and a validation that sustainability matters. And there are ways that, that we can influence as individual consumers, as representatives of our business. 
and lean in. I mean, there were fantastic questions that this group I can already feel is, is there. Just follow, follow your intuition, be a change agent. And, and I know we're all hunkered down and we will end up in an even better world as, as we start to get unleashed. So thank you. I love that. Thank you, Kurt. Um, so those of you who want to stay on for open networking, we will move you over. I want to introduce our talk for next week. It's pretty cool and fun. Um, we're going to be talking about the future of living in space with Anastasia Cristina. She is the founder and CEO of Stellar Amenities. And that company has the mission of kind of creating space habitats that are lightweight, deployable, reconfigurable um, to help support well-being in space. So that should be very interesting for us. Um, so thank you, everybody. A big thanks to Kurt for joining us today. We are so privileged to have you and uh, speak to us today. And with that, what's going to happen now if you want to be moved over into the